Hello, at the height of the Napoleonic Wars, a 21-year-old aristocrat, George Gordon Byron, the sixth Baron Byron, left Falmouth on a ship bound for Portugal. The year was 1809, and for the next two years he travelled through Portugal, Spain and the eastern Mediterranean. During his time abroad, Lord Byron began to work on a long narrative poem about another young nobleman, Harold, who escapes his woes by embarking on a grand tour. Harold is the first Byronic hero, a youth described in the poem's opening stanzas as a shameless white, sore given to rebel and ungodly glee. Published in 1812, the first part of Child Howell's pilgrimage sold out within hours. I awoke one morning and found myself famous, he, supposed, he wrote. Two further instalments only enhanced this fame. The poem is a deeply personal work full of Byron's ideas and opinions, including modern commentary on the political events of his time, shadowed by his own publicly scandalous life. With me to discuss Child Howell's pilgrimage are Jonathan Bate, Professor of English Literature at the University of Warwick, Jane Stabler, Reader in Romanticism at the University of St Andrews, and Emily Bernhard Jackson, Assistant Professor in 19th Century English Literature at the University of Arkansas. Jonathan Bate, let's begin with Byron, born in 1788. Could you give us a sketch of his background? Yeah, he comes from an aristocratic family, um, but he wasn't expecting to become a lord. That's to say his grandfather, who, who was an admiral known as Foulweather Jack, was a younger son of uh, an old aristocratic family, the Barons, who went back to uh, a man who was made a, 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 a who was given lands for his service to Henry VIII, and then um, Charles the Charles the First um, created uh, Baron a lord. But uh, as I say, Baron's grandfather was a younger son. His father then um, was a military man. Uh, Mad Jack, he was known, Captain Barron, uh, went into the guards, but lived a dissolute, profligate life, left the guards, um, seduced um, an aristocratic heiress, and then married her, had a daughter, um, that would be Barron's half-sister, who's going to be an important figure in the story. Um, then Augusta. Augusta, that's right. And then that first wife died, and so Mad Jack... The dissolute father finds himself uh, in debt, on the run from creditors, needs a second wife, finds a Scottish heiress, a rather plain, plump Scottish girl called Catherine, um, meets her in Bath, marries her for her money, and those are Byron's parents. And, as I understand it, he, after three years, he's dead and she's bankrupt. That's right, yeah. Uh, he, he, he leaves her, he goes off, he dies. Um, she goes back to Scotland, to Aberdeen, and Byron is brought up in poverty by his widowed mother and uh, a very strict Calvinist nurse. So that childhood, can you give us a few, two or three uh, points about his childhood, Jonathan? And, and, and also bring in the idea of the, not the idea, bring in the fact of this deformed foot. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's probably sort of psychologically the most important thing um, about his early years and his, his sense of being an outsider, an oddity, um, always rather excluded, vulnerable. He had a club foot um, and he was acutely conscious of that. Um, and there were various operations to, 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 to try to, to straighten it, but uh, you know, he, he, he always had that, that sense um, of, of a mark upon him um, that meant that he, he didn't quite have uh, the kind of the panache, the normality um, that a young gentleman would, would expect. Um, and then I think the absent father, obviously, is, is, is very important as well, and possibly the fact that he was sexually abused by his nurse. Well, that's difficult to prove, isn't it? But any well, as far as I, my reading of your notes is concerned, but anyway, there it is. It's around in possibly. the mix. Around it, we also know that we're told that his his mother's family was one of the most violent families in Scotland. So there's there's quite a mix going on there. Until the age of ten, he went to the local grammar school. Then he got the title, and off he pushed to Harrow, where he uh, he was we're told very lazy, but led a lot of classics. Uh, read a lot of classics. Led a little yobbish riot down in Regent Street, and so we come to. His his first book of poems in 1807, Emily Bernhard Jackson, called Hours of Idleness. Can you say something about the importance of that work and how it was received? Yes, um, Hours of Idleness is Byron's first um, widely published work. Uh, it's preceded by two more privately published books that it's, it, it's based on. Um, it so he's only 19, but still, it, this is his third book. Well, yes. Fine. Um, 
Unfortunately, it Byron wrote a preface to it which managed to be a combination of pretentious and overly humble, and the poems themselves were largely derivative. Um, and the book was reviewed uh, in the Edinburgh Review by Byron, believed by Francis Jeffrey, but in fact by Henry Broom, who would later become famous as Queen Carolyn's counsel in her divorce case. Um, and Broom savaged the book, and he also savaged the author. It was a, a quite deliberate ad hominem attack, and Byron was crushed. <clears throat> well, he's only 21, 20, 21, something like that, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in a nice demonstration that the means of recovery transcend era, he went out and got completely drunk um, and then felt better, but not entirely better. <laughs> um, and it's clear from his letters that he was very upset, hurt and enraged. Um, and in response, he wrote English Bards and Scotch Reviewers, in which he um, decimated in satire all the major and many minor poets of his day, and indeed the Scotch critics that he believed had savaged the book. And although Byron says that he awoke and found himself famous on the publication of Child Harold, that's not strictly speaking true because it was English bards that brought him to real public prominence. He... Well, we must allow him to have some hand in the making of his own myth. And that's oh, well, absolutely. absolutely. But I think it's terrific. This, this sort of boy just turned on the entire... British establishment of poetry, letters, the great Edinburgh Review, the poets of the day, wham, he just went for them. It's terrific, isn't it? I mean, you criticise me and watch out. They were isn't that stone. what all boys dream of doing? No, but he did it, and <laughs> he, he did, did it in style, and as you say, it made his reputation. Can you give us some idea of one or two of the things he said and how they reacted, those who were stabbed? Well, it's slightly problematic because it was published anonymously, although everybody knew that it was, in fact, by Byron. Um, he... He savaged his own, uh, uh, he was the ward of the Earl of Carlisle, uh, who had refused to introduce him in the House of Lords. And Byron, Byron was a good hater, as Johnson says. He, he didn't like to give up on his hatreds, and he didn't give up on his hatred of the Earl of Carlisle, who he was very careful to describe as a terrible poet. Erasmus Darwin, um, he also thought was ridiculous and said so. The interesting thing is that First of all, Byron regretted it later in his career. He regretted that he'd said these things. But also, it became a kind of badge of honor to have been savaged in English bards and Scotch reviewers. Because when, when he became so famous. Well, even but before let's that. Let's stick to the point at the time, if we can. Okay. Sorry about that. He did have a go at a lot of them. Yes. I mean, that's the point then. Yes. So this boy raised his fist and smashed it through the English establishment. Yes. And they had to take notice because it was so well written and written with such passion. So it isn't as if this boy is just giving a yelp in the corner. No, it's not coming at all. centre stage and taking them on. Yes. It's Byron's that's first quite major something, work. isn't it? You were described as a major work. Then in 1809, just a couple of years later, he left England on the grand tour. We're, we're back at war with France. Uh, he doesn't join the army. He doesn't agree with all that at all. Uh, but he goes on the grand tour. Can you give, are there any specific reasons for his going? This remains a mystery to some degree. He, um, he said in his letters that he had to go. Um, but he was fond of that kind of mystery. It may have been because of his homosexual tendencies, which he felt that he could only indulge in the East. Then a crime, of course. Then a crime. Um, he may have felt that he had to go for personal reasons. It may have been to do with um, the kind of sense. He never felt fully at home in England. Um, he felt attracted to the East from a very young age. There was a cult of Hellenism already during the period. All of these seem to have inspired him or to have played a role in his leaving. Jane Steinberg, sometime on this journey, on the hoof, as it were, he began to write uh, Child Harold's Pilgrimage. Can we clear up the child first? Um, a child is an unproven knight. It's the standard title for a nobleman who's not yet won his spurs. So um, Byron is, is setting himself the task of, of proving himself in a, in a way. So can you <coughs> tell us where he went and when he started writing it? Have we any idea why he started writing it? We think he started writing it um, partly because um, Hobhouse had told him to burn the journal that he was that he was keeping at the time. So we know that while they're in Albania, Hobhouse is his companion, yes, friend, somebody who his met best at Cambridge. friend, that's yes, right. from from Cambridge. 
Um, so while they're in Albania together in, in 1809, Hobhouse comes across this, this, this journal, reads it, and presumably because it has um, details of Byron's intimate um, friendships for other men, Hobhouse advises him to, to destroy it. And Byron, Byron needs to write, he always needs to write uh, as an outlet for his, for his uh, imaginative energies. Um, so he, he, turns to, he turns to writing a, a poem. Um, why it's in Spenserian stanza is difficult to say. He had a, um, a book of elegant extracts with him, and Spencer's included in that. He knows Spencer well by this time. He's read a huge amount by the time he's finished Cambridge, and Spencer is listed as one of the, the poets that he, he knows. So he turns to um, Spencer stanza and writes something. It, it's called Child Burren to begin with, and he crosses out Burren um, halfway through um, Canto 1 and ch changes it to Harold. So it, it's, it's more closely identified with his own name to start with. And it's clearly a way of sort of processing his own experience while he's travelling and the question of what he's going to do with his life, which haunts him um, throughout his career. He's graphically describing these places he goes through. So in that sense, it's a, it's a travel... <coughs> it's a, tr a tremendous travelogue, a travel poem, used later, as we'll mention, by people to put in their travel books to give them a sense yes. of poetry whether they're looking at Venice or wherever the, the Alps or wherever they are. Can you just... Is it possible to say briefly what the poem's about, uh, Jane? It's, it's about... Um, by it's long. It's, <laughs> yeah. Very. Um, do you want me to stick to the first two cantos or...? or um, I'll just whip through the whole lot. Whip through the whole lot. OK, well, the, the, the first two cantos are about Byron's travels. Um, can, canto one is um, Portugal and Spain. Um, canto two, um, Albania and Greece. Um, and then Canto Three, which comes out later, that's 1816 after Byron's um, left England um, as a self-imposed exile. That's about um, more about um, Brussels, Waterloo, um, the Rhine, Switzerland, and looking towards looking towards Italy. And then Canto Four is firmly located in Italy, um, particularly Venice and Rome. It's rollicking and robust and full of confidence in this old rhyming system that, he, that, uh, that he's inherited originally from Spencer, but it's been used by Walter Scott, it's been used by Southey, and it's been used by... And he's got a travel element, as I mentioned, but masses of classical allusion, lots of lovely showing off about his classical learning goes on. You needed notes, don't you? Well, I certainly did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should imagine then people did. So he, was he was he setting out to just show them again after the Edinburgh uh, attack on the the critics that he knew a lot as well as could could do this? Yes, I mean the Spenserian form it is difficult, and Byron setting out to write something that's that's difficult that 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 proves he can he can master the the, the craft, but he's also doing something with the he's doing something with the tradition. So whereas um, Spencer's um, uh, pilgrimages are are, um, are sort of stable and patriotic and um, in the interest of fashioning a fashioning a gentleman or, or a quest for virtue you've got something very different going on in child harold as you pointed out at the beginning you've got this um, extremely badly behaved um, knight um, but also you've got byron's satirical interventions in in um, a romance travelogue as well so it's a very hybrid mixed up form it completely wrong footed um, the reviewers when it when it came out it sort of comes out under the radar because it's published by murray it looks as though it's going to be um, um, respectable, antiquarian, travelogue and romance, and it's, and it's uh, neither of those things. As you said, published by Murray Jane, your hand waved over the first edition you brought along with you, which we're all <laughs> almost distracted by. <laughs> I think right, it's so. a terrible thing to bring into this. <laughs> so there we are with him. Now, Jonathan, we've talked about this Spenserian stanza. What are they? Why did you use them? Let's have a few examples. But first of all, what is it? And why did he want to use them? OK, so this is a stanza um, invented by Edmund Spencer, the great Elizabethan epic romantic poet. Um, long <coughs> poem <coughs> divided into so-called cantos, segments. Each And each stanza is, is of nine lines with a, an interlocking rhyme scheme. So you go A, B, A, B, and the... The second pair of rhymes in the first four lines then becomes the first pair of rhymes in the next four lines. And then there's an extra line at the end which has an additional stress and picks up on the final rhyme. And that ninth line, that longer line, is, I think, the key 
to the way that the stanza form can give you a lot of variation of tempo. Just to give you an example. I'm I, things, I've got one for you, in case you haven't got one. Well, I've, it, I've got one here. What's uh, yours? Well, my, mine is it's, it's a really key Byronic image. But there are wanderers o'er eternity whose bark drives on and on and anchored ne'er shall be. A very Byronic idea of life as a voyage never coming to an end. But that final line, whose bark drives on and on, the extra and on, just giving you that sense of the endless journey. What was I yours? Go, well, I, I, I forgot, do you mind? I mean, I, the Elgin marbles, he was there when they were hacked away. He hated it. He hated the British for that. He hated Elgin for the rest of his life. He's a good hater, as you say. <laughs> but that, I just think, this gives an idea of the way he's hammering at it. It is best. Some of it, I think, is a bit... But no. Cold is the heart, fair Greece, that looks on thee, nor feels as lovers or the dust they loved. Dull is the eye that will not weep to see thy walls defaced, thy mouldering shrines removed by British hands, which it had best behoved to guard those relics, ne'er to be restored. Cursed be the hour, they, when from their isle they roved, and once again thy hapless bosom gored, and snatched thy shrinking gods to northern climes abhorred. So he uses it, he can use it for real force, can't he? Like that wonderful description of the bullfight and so yeah. on. Action seems, action and, and venom, uh, it seems to me, are the ways in which he uses this gentle Spencerian force for the best. That's absolutely right. And that's the really innovative thing about the poem. There were lots and lots of travel poems in the period. It was a very recognisable genre. But what's unique about Child Harold's Pilgrimage is that it's simultaneously a travelogue a political poem, as you see with the attack on Lord Elgin, and a very personal poem with all sorts of veiled references to personal scandal. And that's what's new. He's, he's using inherited forms, conventions, kinds of poetry, but in a completely innovative way. Emily, Emily Bernhard Jackson, could you describe the protagonist of the poem? It's, 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 it's a bit tricky, isn't it? Because in the first two cantos, four cantos, four, four books, really, big books, uh, it's, he says it's not him in the first two cantos. He denies it like, like anything, then he comes back and later writes another two. It stretches on for many years, the writing of this poem. And then he says, well, after all, yes, it is based on me. But it's only based on him. So what is the relationship between Byron and Child Harold? Well, it certainly was based on him, but as you said, only based on him. Uh, the difficulty is to know how much based and how much an act of imagination. Um, one of the very interesting things about the poem and the way in, one of the ways in which it's extremely innovative is also that the narrator is also based on Byron to some degree, and so that it becomes very difficult to determine which character when is enacting or speaking what Byron might have spoken or is speaking something totally different. Harold is lives uh, in an ancestral home remarkably like Byron's own ancestral home. Newstead the, Abbey. Yes. The narrator deliberately says, uh, whence his name and lineage long, it suits me not to say, which is one of my favorite lines of the poem, this kind of airy dismissal. But um, one theory is that that's quite a deliberate choice on Byron's part because he had been so attacked in hours of idleness for making a big deal about the fact that he was a lord. He's, in this case, he's just not going to discuss his protagonist's background at all. Harold is <clears throat> more melancholy than Byron seems to have been before he decided to model himself on Harold for publicity reasons to some degree. Um, he takes Byron's journey um, through Europe. Um, he is at the same time a, a mirror of his author and a way for his author to consider himself divorced from himself. And, and that have... makes it very complicated, um, both to separate the two, but also to put them together. Can you give us one or two specific examples? Yes. he <clears throat> Actually, perhaps the best examples occur in the later cantos, um, precisely because there it seems that Harold and Byron are fading together. Um, in the fourth canto, there's just no question that they're the same person. The poem begins with an announcement that, that Byron and Harold did the same thing. I stood in Venice on the Bridge of Sighs. The third canto... That's wonderful, four lines, aren't Yes, they? it's yeah. wonderful. And one of Do the you want to complete them, those uh, four lines? A palace and a prison on each hand. What are the next two? I stood in Venice. I'd love the first two. I stood in Venice, I I stood in Venice on the Bridge of Sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. And that's a wonderful moment because of the use of each which manages to suggest that all palaces are prisons and all prisons contain the possibility to be palaces, which is a very nice Byronic moment. Um, 
In Canto Three, Harold again takes Byron's journey, but also wrestles with all of the issues that Byron himself was wrestling with in the aftermath of his marriage and his his self exile. Uh, the kinds of questions of how you reconstitute a self, how you reconstitute a self through travel and through landscape. Do you um, think he was actively trying to do that? Yes, I do think he was actively trying to do that. Reconstitute a self that he thought was inadequate or hadn't reached I don't his think he thought it was inadequate. Hadn't become, as it were, <coughs> a gentleman. I don't think it was that precisely. I think that the breakup of his marriage was a, a great trauma for him. I've uh, forgotten to say he got married and it broke. He up. got married, uh, he and he got he made. That was later. Never mind. Uh, in, yes, eighteen fourteen. Mm. He he made After a. The first two cantos were published. We haven't got them published yet, but never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> After the first two cantos were published, <laughs> he got married in eighteen fourteen <laughs> and made a disastrous choice. And then, unsurprisingly, it all went horribly wrong. Um, and he. He had to leave his country. He had to leave behind the person that he was in his country. He. This is very freeing to go forward, but at the same time, you lose everything. Jane, Jane Sabler, how can you you push on t from what Emily has said and give us some idea of some of the actions and active events that we have, how they related and to what he himself did. I mean, I mentioned, I think I mentioned, I can't remember, the bullfight, but mm. there's the famous visit to the battlefields of Waterloo, the place of skulls, and the massive, wonderful, and so on and so forth. So this is what he did. Are, there, are they in his notes as well? Yes, they, um, uh, in the first two cantos, um, um, the poem shadows that the, the tour that Byron and Hobhouse made pretty closely um, follows the same geographic route so they, they turn up at Lisbon with its, its kind of wonderful image floating over the wave and then go into, into Lisbon and are appalled by the, by the dirt everything reared in dirt which is standard, standard travelogue um, fodder for, for those days people always complained about dirt in Portugal and um, Byron goes on to look at Sintra and we get asides on the disgraceful convention of Sintra, so a home goal by, by, um, by, by British foreign policy, if you want, let, letting the French get away when, when Making they... Making peace with France yeah. and letting them take all their guns out of Portugal. Yeah, a humiliation, which Byron draws attention to in the poem. Um, so that's seen as un unpatriotic. Then he crosses over the silver streamlet into, into Spain, and as soon as we get into Spain, we get one of those strange dislocations in, in the poem where Byron addresses um, chivalry, the spirit of chivalry, and looks at the huge gulf between the, the old annals of Spain and what's happening here and now in the Peninsula War. And what he does is um, it, he appears to give us a first-hand battle account of two battles, um, Talavera and Albera, and, and in fact he compresses those two events. So he, he didn't actually see either of those. He only hears about Talavera when he gets to Cadiz, and Albuera happens two years later. But he brings them together to talk about the, the shame of war, the, the, the disgrace of war. This is, this is something entirely new in, in English poetry. Ruskin says that Byron's the first Englishman who feels the cruelty of war and the shame of it. And that comes through in, the, in what he says about the Peninsula War, and that's why there's a bullfight there. He's talking about people who, are, who, who regard violence as a sort of spectator sport, and he's appalled by that. He's appalled by the way in which poets have, have become accustomed to, to celebrating war. But it is, it is odd, isn't it, that there are fantastic standards about the bullfight, four or five, and there are fantastic standards about war. So he seems, as a writer, to be relishing it and going for it and describing it vividly and with passion. And then at the end he pulls back and says, but I'll have none of it. That's, that's, that's right. He, he does manage to have his cake and eat it. So well, he can tell the, the glory but, uh, of war and also the horror. <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan, did you want to get in? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just loving this. Um, I, I was thinking um, about what Jane was saying about contrasting the past and the present, the, the old chivalric and, and, and the new. And this, of course, becomes crucial in the second canto when he gets to Greece, because Greece, associated with the origins of liberty, democracy, the arts, great architecture, but Greece is now under the tyranny of the Ottoman Empire. The great buildings of ancient Greece are in, in ruin. I mean, fair Greece, sad relic of departed worth, the famous line about, about Greece. And but he loved ruins, didn't he? he? He loved ruins because they show the transience of all forms of power and empire. Mm. 
Well, he, we we haven't barely time to do Child Harold, but just to say he did uh, he did add copious notes uh, on all sorts of subjects. And can you briefly tell us how yeah, they that's, that's enriched right. what, the work? Uh, um, what, what happens, um, um, particularly in the, in the first two cantos, um, he goes to all these places, describes them sort of poetically, and sort of gives you a kind of emotional response to them. But then he puts in notes um, giving you sort of travel guide type details so you know he sees some convent in the mountains and it's an opportunity for a sort of quasi Wordsworthian piece about the sublimity of the landscape but then in the note he'll tell you exactly where the convent is and a little bit about the history of it he was published uh, in 1812 the first two cantos <coughs> as you know <laughs> by Murray publishing firm still there in Albemarle Street in London um, and it, he, his first two publishers attempted being turned down. Murray took him up. Murray conducted a very interesting campaign, didn't he? And you've mentioned Byron's homosexuality two or three times, but we should also, if you're shoveling this on the table, mention that he claimed to have uh, seduced 200 women in the in the month, two months carnival in Venice. Um, and uh, Murray put about that he was a great seducer of aristocratic ladies in London. And Byron's reputation as, a, as that sort of London re- rake... Uh, in a way, I think, but what do you think? Sold the book. 500, li- these, well, like this beautiful book on the table, the f- 500 editions were, uh, copies were published, first of all, very, very expensively, and they became the rage of the aristocracy. Murray immediately went in with a cheaper version. That became the rage of the rest of people. Yes. Um, I, certainly his reputation as a Regency rake helped. Murray also capitalised on the fact that, that he was he had given a speech in the House of Lords when the book is first published, its advertisements say it's by Lord Byron who recently gave this speech. He also capitalised on... And it was a Republican speech, isn't it? Yes, it it was. Um, In fact, he only gave two speeches and both of them were extremely liberal. Uh, His politics were extremely liberal, as as Child Harold makes clear, and that also caused all kinds of trouble with the reviewers in Cantos 1 and 2. They had great trouble with the liberal politics. They found that unacceptable. But he was right to write that he did awake to find himself famous one morning because he, it, the book just took off, didn't it, in, in terms of a publication event that scarcely, if ever, been anything like Yes, it. absolutely. He, he was famous in a way that it's, it's almost impossible for us to comprehend now because fame is everywhere and everybody is famous. Um, he wasn't quite the first celebrity, but he was very nearly the first celebrity and certainly the first in the kind of chinaware, tea towels sense of... I mean, his image, his face was everywhere. He was fortunate to have a good face, and and Murray recognised that. And his a, a large portion of his audience was female and responded both to his looks and to his aura of dangerous sexuality, which he cultivated. Um, it, yes, it all helped. Um, and he came back to London and had four years of, as you say, celebrity, fame, uh, and the wonder of it all. And then uh, he left in 1816, as it happens, never to return, but he left n- notorious. He was hissed in theatres, he was hissed in the House of Lords. He was he was more than a scandal, he was an outrage. They wanted him out, out of the country, out of off the island. What had happened? Well, <clears throat> he had had an affair with his half-sister um, of some duration. Uh, and that got out? That got out. Um, although, interestingly... What seems to have caused more problems were the rumors that he had practiced homosexuality in the East, that he had attempted to perform sodomy with his wife and with Lady Carolyn Lamb, both. Um, the th- these were all rumors. There was a when the Byrons separated, Lady Byron mounted a kind of campaign to make sure that she would come out well, a very modern campaign, and part of that was spreading these rumours. Um, what credence do you give to them? I would say he certainly had an affair with his sister. I would say that's that's beyond question. Um, although he, d- you know, he didn't announce it to the world. I, in fact, I'd give full credence to all of them. I mean, her daughter, much. Medora, may well have been by Yes, Byron. It's, it's very possible that she, that she had a child by Byron. Um, and we, it was a sexual scandal that, that caused the the whirlwind that drove him to the 
realisation or the conclusion that he'd got to get out, he couldn't live in this city any longer. It was, though, of course, often the case in history, a sexual scandal is a sort of convenient front for getting rid of someone who's politically awkward. If you think of the, you know, the fall of Parnell at the end of that century, yes, it was predominantly a sexual scandal, but this is a time, you know, the, the, the period after the Battle of Waterloo, the defeat of Napoleon, when politics are shifting very much to the right, um, and so to have this dangerously liberal lord in a very kind of prominent position in London society, there were a lot of vested interests politically uh, for whom it was good to have him out of the way. How did that, Jane, how did the, 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 the dangerous political lord show himself? We, we know he spoke twice in the House of Lords, once sort of in support of the, the frame breakers, uh, who were sort of a form of Luddites, really. But how, was he that dangerous in society, or was it, was his, did his politics seem something on the side? He, he was um, he was a good weapon for for Holland House. So he, he he spoke on he spoke for the frame breakers and in favour of Catholic emancipation and in favour of um, reform too. There's the, the major Cartwright petition in 1813. So um, all his appearances are 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 um, good, um, eloquent and r robust um, um, arguments for 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 radical reform. Um, as well as that, he he he, he produces poems which are which are um, pr pro Whig and, and anti anti government. So Windsor Poetics is a scathing satire on on the Prince Regent, uh, as is Lines to a Lady Weeping. These come out anonymously in the Morning Chronicle, but then they're gradually associated with with Byron's name. And and he is a he's a force to be reckoned with. Meanwhile, his literary thing is pounding on in. On unbelievable ways, the Corsair comes out and sells 10,000 copies in a day, which had never, as far as we know, happened in literature ever. No, he's, he's, a, he's a phenomenon, that's uh, undoubted. Um, Emily Byrne, so he goes away again and, and he con decides to continue Child Harold. He's had two cantos, we're going to end up with four cantos. He's a book, four books, he's, he's writing other books as well. Emily Bernhard, one of the most famous descriptions is his description of the battlefield at Waterloo. Can yes. you tell us something about that? And I hope, can you quote from it? Um... I didn't bring anything I've to quote. I've got some here. <laughs> Just a second. Here we are. Here we are. But anyway, can you tell us about it? <clears throat> yes. Um, I do think that one thing that is important as background for Harold III, thank you, is that it's not just that people wanted Byron to leave England. Byron wanted to leave England. He, And he came into his own after he removed to Europe. Uh, he, he called England that tight little island and he felt that he was not able to be the person that he could be while he was here. Um, when he when he leaves, he yes, he goes to Waterloo, and um, he calls it a place of skulls, the grave of France, the deadly Waterloo, how in an hour the power which gave annuls its gifts, transferring fame as fleeting, too. In pride of place, here last the eagle flew, then tore with bloody talon the rent plain pierced by the shaft of banded nations through ambitions, life, and labors, all were vain. He uses it as a chance to meditate on the fall of Napoleon, um, and via that also indeed on his own fall. That's how much of the poem works. But as he points out late in the next stanza, he says, Gaul may champ the bit and foam in fetters, but is earth more free? This is... Um, Yes, Napoleon has fallen. Yes, France and its its power have been contained, but there's really no gain as far as he's concerned politically. It doesn't improve the lot of the earth, and it picks up in this way on the stanzas in one and two about Talavera and Albuera, mm -hmm. this kind of sense that war is is pointless, ultimately, that, that the plain of Waterloo is a place of skulls. There's a wonderful moment where he looks at it and he says... Um, he talks about the battle and he says how that red rain hath made the harvest grow as if the sense is that it's that's all that it's done is just make for richer grass yes and just just adding to that that the continuity between one one and two is also that byron pitches himself against wellington who's an english national hero at the yes. time so so uh, but byron refuses to celebrate anything to do with wellington and, and and waterloo and walter scott's slightly appalled by this he says he manages to write about waterloo without letting one laurel fall on the head of wellington it's seen as a it's seen as a sort of scandal that he won't even ad admit any any he, he he thinks that wellington was just lucky at waterloo there's a fascination with napoleon i mean napoleon and byron are the two most famous people in europe so for byron to to go to the site of Napoleon's fall. There's an inevitable symmetry there. And yet, 
that, that, that sound of reverie by night, the zest comes in, the ball the night before, you feel he's loving it. He wished he'd been there. <laughs> Don't you feel that? Well, yes. I mean, it's always, it's always <laughs> a and problem. And then charging off on his horse and having a go. The, 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 no? The, yes. the problem, the, the problem for a, a poet who is a man of words always has a fascination with, with the man of action. You know, Byron is reporting on the great historical events of the time. But, you know, Napoleon had actually shaped them. And, of course, it's, uh, it, it's, it, you can almost begin to see there a, a gleam in Byron's eyes as he thinks about the idea that he, too, could become a man of political action, which eventually he does. I'm not... I don't think it's quite that cut and dried because I think Byron thought of himself, even at this time, as a man of action, that he had given those speeches, particularly as a form of action. And not only that, but... This, these stanzas of Harold III and Harold III entirely are concerned with the question of how an individual can view and change the world, um, even if only in his own brain. And I think that that's a, that's a good deal of what's going on here. Is when, As you say, he has this kind of zest for the night before the battle, which he then contrasts with the awfulness of the battle itself. But that in itself raises the question of how you wish to conceive of something. Do you conceive of something as a kind of triumph with a ball beforehand, or do you conceive of it as a terrible loss? Uh, Byron... Um, did not give up on Napoleon. He wasn't quite like William Hazlitt, who just loved Napoleon for his whole life, but Byron felt that he, he was greatly distressed that Napoleon didn't commit suicide. He felt that that was a big mistake. Um, but he also didn't... He, he never lost the sense that Napoleon had been a great man. Uh, he felt that Napoleon's problem was basically that he, he had never made... Uh, he had made no bones about the fact that he was a great man, that that was the issue. Yes, it's his, his want of community with the rest of mankind. <coughs> yes. Byron sees as his big mistake. Yes. Jane, the people will know the idea of the Byronic man, the Byronic hero. Can you tell us what you mean by that? It's a, it's a, a compound of the figures that come out of Child Harold and the, and the Turkish tales. So it's a, um, it's, it's a man marked by um, um, a guilt and a nameless crime who invites the people who look at him to, 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 um, to, to read into him, to, 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 to work out what that is. One of the things Wilson says about, uh, about Byron's poetry, John Wilson, is, uh, in the Edinburgh, is that um, every, every, every reader feels as though they're an individual. He says, we feel as though we are chosen from a crowd of lovers. And so the Byronic hero sets up a kind of special intimate relationship with the, with the reader or with the, the person who's observing him and invites them to, to enter into his consciousness. So it's a peculiarly confessional sort of being. Jonathan, um... He, he's, he was very contemptuous about other romantic poets, particularly Wordsworth and Southey, and he's very rude about Wordsworth. And yet, when I read this, and I, I hadn't read all of it before, and I, the last time I read, the parts I read was many years ago, there's an awful lot of nicked from Wordsworth, to be quite honest. He's alone in the mountains, and, and you think, hold on, I could, we could transfer that to many a poem we know about Wordsworth. So what is this rudeness to Wordsworth when he's yeah. taking great gobbets of him? That's absolutely right, especially in that, um, that third canto, uh, which also uh, relates to the time that he, he met with Shelley, a, another poet who, who, who was deeply influenced by Wordsworth's vision of... Um, in that little thing where, where, where his wife wrote Frankenstein. That's, that's that meeting, that's, yes. that, that's and, that meeting and there. And Byron had that's another right. child by... Yeah. That's right. Um, the, I mean, the Wordsworthian idea um, of achieving a kind of wholeness of being through a sublime uh, sense of, of unity with nature, that is everywhere in Byron. But the thing that Byron doesn't like about Wordsworth is the sense of isolation, the kind of egotism that goes with that. Um, because Byron always, going back to what Jane said, um, loves the idea of a human community, and that, so that's his beef with Wordsworth. The sense he says of Wordsworth in the poem that he likes to be alone. He's, he's not a herd, he's not of the herd of men, and that, so he, he he's full of these lush contradictions. Aren't that's they? that's exactly right, and mm. and surely you know his erotic life is part of that. I mean, what the you know the, the restless desire to conquer every woman that that that, that he he finds, um, in some sense he's you know he's he's looking for. For, for an uh, ideal partnership, but he never finds it. So he is always at some level alone, always driving on. Um, um, Emily, Hazlitt said that of Byron, he's a martyr in his zeal in the cause of freedom. Is it possible 
briefly, I'm sorry, to, to give okay. the listeners some idea of the impact he had on political Republican leaders across Europe. After his death at Missolonghi in Greece, he was a national hero of Greece, and it rippled right across Europe. Yes, it? actually it is, and there's a there's a nice story that encapsulates this. But, but first of all, yes, in Greece, he's primarily seen as a political hero, remains a political hero. Um, he, there was a cult of Byron in every European country after his death, indeed before his death, and that had as much to do with politics as anything else, um, except for Portugal. There was no cult of Byron in Portugal because he had insulted them so thoroughly that they never forgave him. Um, and interestingly, when Brazil became independent from Portugal, one thing that they did was they set up a cult of Byron, specifically as an active demonstration, a political demonstration of the fact that, that they were not Portuguese. His but influence the, was such. But the idea of Byron and what he'd said stood for great, motivated and charged the ideals and, 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 and actions of a great number of people across Europe. The charges? Across Europe, and but also the people. chartists yes. at home. Yes. It's, that has faded because what we have come to know of Byron is more the Byronic hero than anything else. But it, it would be a mistake to underestimate his value as a, as a political personage. Can I ask any of you, uh, very briefly, I'm sorry, it's a pity, anyway, become, the influence he's had on other artists, uh, that is too has been massive. Do you want to reel off one or two of them, uh, Jane? Oh, um, Berlioz, um, Harold in Italy. Pushkin, uh, uh, the great Russian poet. Uh, actually, mo mostly pop music for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, let's say Bram Stoker with Dracula. Every vampire that you encounter is based on Lord Byron. Um, and then, but, but the other, there's Verdi and the Schumann, uh, and on it goes, doesn't it? So, I'm quite exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a few more minutes. Oh, we haven't. Oh, yes, we've got one more minute. Um, Tom's got carried away, and his fingers are going up in, in different directions <laughs> in the booth there. Is, there. is there a final word anyone would like to give to this uh, programme? Well, I, I think um, Emily talks of rock musicians. I mean, if, if you think of um, Mick Jagger, um, that sense of the, the, the swaggering, dangerous artist, the rock star. I mean, the, like it or not, Byron was the rock star of his age. And in that sense, um, an awful lot of modern culture comes from him. And yet, at the same time, he, he was deeply committed to his own culture and a figure of extraordinary political importance, which Mick Jagger isn't. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan Bate, Emily Bernard-Jackson and Jane Stabler. Next week, we'll be talking about randomness and pseudo-randomness. Thanks for listening. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Thomas Morris and you can add to the debate page, receive Melvin's newsletter and the podcast by visiting the In Our Time page of the Radio 4 website. Next this morning here on BBC Radio 4 FM, the book of the week continues the true story of an American mother who banned her three angry teenagers from the digital world for six months and lived to tell the tale. Before that, Jeremy Bowen looks ahead to next week. I'm in classic wine country. Lavender borders run past neat rows of vines. But this isn't France or California. It's the Bekar Valley, the wine heartland of Lebanon. Taste wine from Lebanon, and as well as what can be a great mouthful, you get the tenacity and determination of people who've been dealt a tough hand. Nature is generous here, and beautiful. The politics and history of this part of the Middle East are not. But Lebanon's winemakers keep going, despite the many challenges, as I've been finding out. Join me, Jeremy Bowen, next Wednesday at 11 on... Do no, but he did it, and he, he did, did it in style, and as you say, it made his reputation. Can you give us some idea of one or two of the things he said and how they reacted, those who were stabbed? Well, it's slightly problematic because it was published anonymously, although everybody knew that it was, in fact, by Byron. Um, he, he savaged his own... Uh, uh, he was the ward of the Earl of Carlisle, uh, who had refused to introduce him in the House of Lords. And Byron, Byron was a good hater, 
as Johnson says, he he didn't like to give up on his hatreds, and he didn't give up on his hatred of the Earl of Carlisle, who he was very careful to describe as a terrible poet. Erasmus Darwin, um, he also thought was ridiculous and said so. The interesting thing is that, first of all, Byron regretted it later in his career. He regretted that he'd said these things. But also, it became a kind of badge of honor to have been savaged in English bards and Scotch reviewers. Because when, when he became so famous. Well, even but before let's that. Let's stick to the point at the time, if we can. Okay. Sorry about that. He did have a go at a lot of them. Yes. I mean, that's the point then. Yes. So this boy raised his fist and smashed it through the English establishment. Yes. And they had to take notice because it was so well written and written with such passion. So it isn't as if this boy is just giving a yelp in the corner. No, it's not coming centre stage and taking them on. Yes. It's Byron's that's first major work. isn't it? You were described as a major work. Then in 1809, just a couple of years later, he left England on the grand tour. We're, we're back at war with France. Uh, he doesn't join the army. He doesn't agree with all that at all. Uh, but he goes on the grand tour. Can you give, are there any specific reasons for his going? This remains a mystery to some degree. He Charles the Charles the first um, created uh, Byron a lord, but uh, as I say, Byron's grandfather was a younger son. His father then um, was a military man, uh, Mad Jack. He was known Captain Byron. Uh, went into the guards, but lived a dissolute, profligate life. Left the guards, um, seduced um, an aristocratic heiress, and then married her. Had a daughter. Um, that would be Byron's half-sister, who's going to be an important figure in the story. Um, then Augusta. Augusta, that's right. Um, then that first wife died, and so Mad Jack, the dissolute father, finds himself uh, in debt, on the run from creditors, needs a second wife, finds a Scottish heiress, a rather plain, plump Scottish girl called Catherine, um, meets her in Bath, marries her for her money... And those are Byron's parents. And as I understand it, he after three years he's dead and she's bankrupt. That's right. Yeah, uh, he 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 leaves her. He goes off. He dies. Um, she goes back to Scotland to Aberdeen, and Byron is brought up in poverty by his widowed mother and uh, a very strict Calvinist nurse. So that childhood. Can you give us a few, two or three uh, points about his childhood, Jonathan? And, and, we, and also bring in the idea of the, not the idea, bring in the fact of this deformed foot. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's probably sort of psychologically the most important thing um, about his early years and his, his sense of being an outsider, an oddity. Um. Hello, at the height of the Napoleonic Wars, a 21-year-old aristocrat, George Gordon Byron, the sixth Baron Byron, left Falmouth on a ship bound for Portugal. The year was 1809, and for the next two years he travelled through Portugal, Spain and the eastern Mediterranean. During his time abroad, Lord Byron began to work on a long narrative poem about another young nobleman, Harold, who escapes his woes by embarking on a grand tour. Harold is the first Byronic hero, a youth described in the poem's opening stanzas as a shameless wight, saw given to revel and ungodly glee. Published in 1812, the first part of Child Howell's pilgrimage sold out within hours. I awoke one morning and found myself famous, he supposed he wrote. Two further instalments only enhanced this fame. The poem is a deeply personal work full of Byron's ideas and opinions, including modern commentary on the political events of his time, shadowed by his own publicly scandalous life. With me to discuss Child Hull's pilgrimage are Jonathan Bate, Professor of English Literature at the University of Warwick, Jane Stabler, Reader in Romanticism at the University of St Andrews, and Emily Bernhard Jackson, Assistant Professor in 19th Century English Literature at the University of Arkansas. Jonathan Bate, Let's begin with Byron, born in 1788. Could you give us a sketch of his background? Yeah, he comes from an aristocratic family, um, but he wasn't expecting to become a lord. That's to say his grandfather, who, who was an admiral known as Foulweather Jack, was a younger son of uh, an old aristocratic family, the Byrons, who went back to uh, a man who was made a, 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 a who was given lands for his service to Henry VIII, and then um, always rather excluded, vulnerable. He had a club foot, um, and he was acutely conscious of that. Um, 
and there were various operations to to to, to try to to straighten it. But uh, you know, he 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 always had that that sense um, of of a mark upon him um, that meant that he he didn't quite have uh, the kind of the panache, the normality um, that a young gentleman would would expect. Um, and then I think the absent father, obviously, is, is, is very important as well, and possibly the fact that he was sexually abused by his nurse. Well, that's difficult to prove, isn't it? But any, well, as far as I, my reading of your notes is concerned, but anyway, there it is. It's around in the mix. Around it. And we also know that we're told that his his mother's family was one of the most violent families in Scotland. So there's there's quite a mix going on there. Until the age of ten, he went to the local grammar school. Then he got the title, and off he pushed to Harrow, where he uh, he was. We're told very lazy, but led a lot of classics. Uh, read a lot of classics. Led a little yobbish riot down in Regent Street, and so we come to. His his first book of poems in 1807, Emily Bernhard Jackson, called Hours of Idleness. Can you say something about the importance of that work and how it was received? Yes, um, Hours of Idleness is Byron's first um, widely published work. Uh, it's preceded by two more privately published books that it's just, it, it's based on. Um, it so he's only 19, but still, it, this is his third book. Well, yes. Fine. Um, unfortunately, it... Byron wrote a preface to it which managed to be a combination of pretentious and overly humble, and the poems themselves were largely derivative, um, and the book was reviewed uh, in the Edinburgh Review by, Byron believed by Francis Jeffrey, but in fact by Henry Broom, who would later become famous as Queen Carolyn's counsel in her divorce case, um, and Broom savaged the book. And he also savaged the author. It was a, a quite deliberate ad hominem attack. And Byron was crushed. <clears throat> well, he was only 21, 20, 21, something like that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in a nice demonstration that the means of recovery transcend era, he went out and got completely drunk um, and then felt better but not entirely better. <laughs> um, and it's clear from his letters that he was very upset, hurt and enraged. Um, and in response, he wrote English Bards and Scotch Reviewers, in which he um, decimated in satire all the major and many minor poets of his day, and indeed the Scotch critics that he believed had savaged the book. And although Byron says that he awoke and found himself famous on the publication of Child Harold, that's not strictly speaking true, because it was English Bards that brought him to real public prominence. He well, we must allow him to have some hand in the making of his own myth. And that's oh, well, absolutely. absolutely. But I think it's terrific. This, this sort of boy just turned on the entire British establishment of poetry, letters, the great Edinburgh Review, the poets of the day. Wham! He just went for them. It's terrific, isn't it? I mean, you criticise me and watch out. Isn't that what all boys dream 